We now have the floor open for discussion and I have not yet a question, but oh yeah, there. Until there's no micro. Yeah, okay. Then. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting work, all of you. Um, and I, I um, uh, so I'm going to take the opportunity to ask you an unfair question, uh, since it wasn't part of your analysis. You're looking at global issues. There, are the the uh, climate negotiations are very much focused around the difference between high income, historically high emitting countries, and lower income countries where the impacts are disproportionately high. Um, and there are issues with, uh, with uh, bringing the technology for mitigation to low-income countries where they often have a high risk premium, it makes capital costly, it makes debt, uh, indebtedness highly uh, a, a likely outcome. And I'm wondering if you have considered doing a north-south version of your model to see some of those dynamics. Thank you. Okay. Um, I wanted to collect questions, but as we do not yet have, oh yeah, we do. <laughs> um, we have one person here in the front row, and then there are two in the back row. Yeah. Test. Thanks. Uh, Rudy van Arnhem from the University of Utah. Thank you very much for these interesting presentations. Um, it seems to me, actually, it's, it's sort of a follow-up question to Eric. Um, they, the, what you're talking about is the possibility of uh, transitioning and doing so or managing the costs and the interactions between the macroeconomy and the, and the climate. And that's wonderful. But it seems to me that the key problem is not economic, but it is political. Uh, so the question is, you're talking about how do we do this and how do we pay for it? What's the smart thing to do and how do we avoid catastrophe, either climate or economic? But the, the barriers are all political. How do we get over those, either within a country or in the north or the south or the globe as a whole? Thank you. Thank you. There's direct there's a neighbor directly next to him, yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michalis Nikiforos from the University of Geneva. I have a question for Andrea Roventini and a question for the whole panel. The first question is, what is the nature of this tipping point? Like, can you, what is the, the intuition behind this nonlinearity that you find in your model? The second question is how the recent uh, events with the increase in uh, energy prices um, have affected your thought about the transition. Like how China closing down coal plants and ha can have these uh, side effects and then can uh, affect the transition to clean energy. Thank you. Hello, um, Antoine Monserrand from uh, University of Paris 13. Um, I will go on with the remark on what you didn't talk about. Um, because I feel like the topic was social ecological transformation. And I feel we have only heard or mostly heard about climate and carbon. And socio, to me, socio ecological transformation is much broader. Uh, and like we have the six uh, mass extinction going on and we have biophysical uh, cycles uh, disrupted globally and we're only focusing on carbon and to me it's like we have a, a, a person in front of us that has a, a heart disease, a lung disease, the kidneys that are not working properly anymore and we're only looking for the lungs. And, and even sometimes we're looking for um, 
uh, a solution that would uh, that would solve the, the 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 lung problem, but that will make the heart uh, stop quicker. So, um, yeah, I, I think we we think we we need to to think more broadly about all these issues, and maybe the the growth rate, for instance, is not. Uh, a, a var valid uh, variable anymore to look at, um, yeah. And maybe it's not all about investment because we all we, you all talked a, a, a lot about investment, but for instance, there is also a lot on on behavior or, or social uh, structures, like why is this room heated at 25 degrees? Why did why did almost all of us come on a plane where, while the train is available? Maybe it's a time constraint, but it's not all a constraint on investment and how to pay for. If it was only how to pay for the transition, that would be very easy. Keynes said it, socialization of investment, public investment, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Just to give some credit to the uh, presenters, we invited them to focus on the ecological issues. <laughs> but of course, next panels will also pick up the other things. I, th I just think we should go in reverse order of the presentation. Okay, so let me just go for the, from the first point, which are uh, together. So yes, the, the problem is, uh, is political and we, it would be interesting to have a north-south model. We are working on it. We would like to have it. With agent based model, it's a little bit complicated because it takes time. But in principle, you can do like a computable general equilibrium integrated assessment model. So you have a very big zone of the world and you link with uh, each other. Uh, then, uh, to be honest, it's true that the problem is political, but economists, I think, I mean, in, it, in Italy, economics is called economia politica because economist has a role also in terms of uh, policy. And uh, I think that we really need to inform the political uh, debate because, for instance, in my country, you have uh, the Minister of Ecologic, Ecological Transition, for instance, which is saying weird things like that this transition will be very costly for our economy and is a things for a gauche caviar or radical chic. Well, if you provide- A bloodbath, eh? that's what he said, a bloodbath. Yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. Uh, so if you, if you provide consistent result from different models, for instance, from my model, the model of Maria that shows that you can achieve this transition and is good for the economy and you can inform the public opinion, well, you don't allow this politician or other policymaker, or I would say also other economists, to stand up and say that you cannot do this uh, transition. So the, I think that the role of economists in this time is very uh, um, important. I would say more than the one of the dentist, uh, quoting uh, Keynes. Uh, the nature of tipping point is very simple. So you have that in the very beginning, you have this very negligible cost that hit the firms. But as the temperature increase at some point, this, co this uh, uh, climate shocks becomes more and more frequent and their magnitude increase over time. So typically you get what you are observing uh, now or what basically the IPCC is telling you that if we don't do anything, what you expect is a frequent uh, amount of climate disaster and also of higher uh, impact in the, uh, in the system. And the thing that the current energy crisis, and again here is important, the work of, of the model and the economists against the politician, which basically uh, tell me that we, may, we miss an opportunity to play, uh, so to speak, Schumpeterian move and invest much before in green uh, uh, energy, because if we would have a much higher penetration of green energy production, we would have absorbed much better this uh, crisis. So this is partially was recognized by Timmermans uh, recently. It was a, a missed opportunity for uh, Europe. Well, it's true that this model don't have mass extinction. Uh, it's also true that, as uh, Emanuele was saying, that climate change is one of the, maybe the biggest threat to the sustainability of uh, our uh, planet. And uh, if you are able to solve climate change, this would really contribute to solve many other things, even though not all of them, I, t I totally agree with you. Uh, what is, what uh, I completely disagree with you 
is the point that uh, is behavioral things. So it's true that if we if we change our behavior and we take the train and the temperature is a lower uh, the, the room has a lower temperature, things improve. But this is also it's not your case, eh, but this is really pushed by some lobby to say that these behavioral things just to, to make people uh, guilty because there is not this uh, transition is a way not to take all the problem in, uh, from the government point of view and to enforce strict uh, policy. This was an, an argument in the very recent book of Michael Mann about the, uh, the climate uh, war. Just, I just wanted to, to be precise on that, thanks. I should go next, I suppose. Um, and probably I should start with uh, the last part and what uh, Antoine mentioned. You can hear me, hopefully, yeah. now. No. So, thanks. So, um, I could start with uh, the last question that Antoine made. And, and I totally agree that we need to focus on uh, social issues as well. Uh, so, I tried to uh, explain in my presentation that it's not only about uh, fiscal policies, financial policies, regulation policies. We need also to uh, change uh, the way that we consume. So, this is why I saw some simulations in which we have a decline in consumption and how this will affect the economy. So, obviously, as we expect this creates problems uh, in economic activity, I used some graphs uh, that uh, were referring to the growth rate of output. But if you had a look at the list of indicators, that I have at the end for the evaluation. I didn't include the growth rate of output. I uh, used the unemployment rate because this, I think, is an indicator that we uh, need to uh, consider. So I care mostly about the unemployment rate. So in this type of scenario, I obviously have this decline in uh, consumption, but at the same time, because we need to deal with various issues uh, that might arise as the increase in the unemployment rate, I also had this uh, decline in working hours. So I think it's important to uh, point out this type of policies, initiatives actually, that we can take, and I totally agree that we can have a different transportation system. And I'm not talking only about uh, you know, uh, trips as someone who comes from the US obviously cannot uh, come uh, on a boat or on a something like that. But obviously we can change the way uh, that uh, we uh, behave and we can have an effect but at the same time, we might need some complementary policies because otherwise other problems are created. Uh, initially, I talked a little bit about this uh, decline in working hours, but then at the end, I didn't have time to go through that. I also said that we need uh, also to have at the same time probably an increase in public spending. So we need the government to step in uh, to have uh, this green type of expenditure. So when we have all this uh, post-growth, degrowth um, discussion, I think it would be good to clarify that when we talk about economic activity, we have all these simple separate components of economic activity. So usually, uh, in my analysis, this is what I do. I try to say that we need to restrict what has to do with consumption, but not so much uh, about the government. I think that the government needs to play a role. I didn't mention that uh, at the end. I had it as a first of the uh, research. And uh, I think, and you know, that uh, when we have, like, uh, the uh, green uh, public expenditure, uh, we can have more uh, transportation. And as a result, we can also have um, people being able, instead of using uh, the car, to use this transportation. So I am in favor of this type of uh, complementarities. Um, yes. Uh, probably I can also say some things about the political issues that uh, you mentioned uh, and also about, uh, as I uh, said in the model, it's a global one. Uh, I uh, emphasize that obviously uh, research uh, needs to be done in order to have uh, different uh, country uh, uh, economy models, but also, as you said, global north and the global south. I totally agree, and uh, my understanding is that Antoine then will touch upon this uh, tomorrow, uh, so hopefully we will uh, hear more about that, and they have worked uh, a lot at the AFD on this. Um, but in any case, I think it's important, and it, that was one of the last points that I have on the slides. It was that uh, so far I have assumed that all of these type of policies are implemented as if all uh, policymakers agree that they're going to implement them. We know that in reality this is not the case. We might have uh, some governments like the US, China, and so on not being willing uh, to have all of these uh, policies. So obviously there is not only a coordination policy uh, issue, but a political economy issue. And this is not reflected overall well uh, in um, post-Keynesian models, I would say. So as a result, also, we don't have something like that in ecological SFC models, for example. And I would 
would say that that would be a further area of research. But I didn't have time to explain this during my presentation. Thanks so much. Right. Let me <clears throat> try to be brief because I agree with uh, most of the points that have been made and also what has been said uh, here by Maria and, uh, and Andrea. Um, about the north-south uh, um, model, yes, I mean, I couldn't agree more. Um, one of my uh, PhD papers was a north-south version of the DICE model. That wasn't very successful, to be honest, but uh, it, it, it still exists. And I think um, um, Engelbert and, and Asjad Nakvi might have a, an SFC model with two countries. I've seen others. I think uh, it complicates a lot the picture because you have all these trade and financial flows, so it becomes a bit messy. Uh, still, I think that maybe um, the problem can be analyzed maybe looking at multi, in a multi-regional setting, which brings us in another dimension. And I'm sure you're aware already of these uh, um, uh, ideas. Uh, for instance, looking at the distribution of transition-related costs using a multi-regional setting. So it, this, is, this can be done in a CGE framework, in an input-output framework. You, you have a distribution of, of policies and you see how this results in a distribution of, of costs. And uh, that could be um, a way to go, I think. Uh, regarding the, uh, the problem is political, yes, absolutely. Um, I agree. I have two main reactions. The first one is that I always feel that maybe the role, uh, this is Andreas, um, I'm repeating what Andreas said. The role of economists and social scientists in general can be understood also to inform and push uh, uh, the political uh, dimension through uh, what we do, right, our work. Uh, however, I would also add another point, which is we can include, we can try to include political and political economy elements uh, in models or in general uh, in research. I didn't have the time to, to show um, uh, this, but uh, the research that I was mentioning on central banks and financial supervisors, um, in, in my case, it's very institutional, right, rather than political in itself, but still, it's a political economy dimension, uh, and uh, I agree, it's, uh, it's very important. Um, biodiversity, yes, I, I completely agree. Um, you know, there's a limited amount of time that one has, and uh, in a way, climate is also easier to address. It's a clearer problem. Right. Um, regarding uh, investments and behavior, I also agree in in the be, in a change of behavior, but I would like to also point out that things like carbon prices, right? Th we usually refer to them as as, as uh, conducive to investments, but they also change consumption behavior. Um, so. To connect to another question, um, you know, if, if we were to have high carbon taxes, the plane would be the less convenient option and more people would go by train. And this also leads me to say, no, the energy prices increase didn't change my mind on the, on the transition. Uh, the reasons were not ecological, if you want, uh, uh, this time, but ultimately this is what we're, we've been up advocating for decades, right, to increase the relative costs of certain things and decrease the relative costs of others with, of course, the social protection that is always needed to um, uh, allow energy access to uh, lower um, income households. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have three more people on my list. Sebastian first and then here in the front and there in the back. Yeah, thank you very much for all uh, three presentations. Um, I want to touch on uh, the point that Emanuele was just making in his final statement about the role of carbon taxes. And, uh, but the question goes more to Maria and, and to Andrea. Um, so not like the big questions that were raised before, but a little bit more of a technical question. Um, so uh, in your models, when you, Andrea showed, showed one of the graphs where uh, you, you simulated a strong increase in, in, in the carbon tax and, and what would be the, the effect of this on unemployment. Um, so in your models, how does it work out? Uh, how are these, these funds uh, recycled? Um, and maybe what would also be the implications in terms of um, the, 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 uh, the feedback effects and the, and the rebound effects that, 
that come out of this recycling of, of these funds. Thank you. Hello, my name is Gregor Semenyuk. I'm at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And um, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, my question is very similar to the one that came before. And I wanted to ask you about kind of the political context in which you are saying that carbon prices essentially are a bad thing to do, if I understood you correctly. Maria, in your case, you had a poor economic performance unless you did certain green uh, subsidies, which I guess is sort of a carbon dividend maybe. Uh, Andrea, in your case, you couldn't effectively mitigate climate change. You also had some very drastic uh, carbon prices which were constant across the period, but also some that were rising, which is probably more in line with some of the other proposals. And I mean, the surprising thing is that I think almost all economists will say carbon prices are the most important policy instrument. And they are really a minority overall in terms of the political discourse. But within economics, there's a strong consensus. And I was wondering first, um, you know, what your models actually say about this consensus from your point of view, uh, um, and also what you think about policies that combine carbon prices with perhaps all of the other policies that you gave uh, us as examples, and maybe many more, and whether you think it's a good idea to combine them with other policies, or whether they really always are as negative as you said. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm Elena Hofferber from the University of Leeds. Um, thank you for your presentations. I am curious to hear, so many of your models actually accept um, temperature rises up to three degrees. And um, yeah, and I mean, when we just think about what climate change looks like and what the implications would be, that's actually drastic. Um, and so I'm wondering, how many models, and are there any models that just say, no, okay, we just don't even model three degrees because <laughs> that's a uh, disaster. But we start from assuming we can't go beyond 1.5 or let's even accept two. And how that would actually change first the modeling exercise, but then also potentially future research questions. Um, and yeah, what do you think from your models? Well. Question one, are there models that take this approach from capping uh, the temperatures in the first place and then go back to what would need to change in that way? And then second, what, uh, in how far would you think that uh, research questions and avenues would change or need to be complemented? Thank you. There's one more person. Hi, um, I'm Lars Rizal Mercedes from the Leibniz Institute of Ecological Urban Regional Development. Um, I have two basic questions I try to make quick. So first is on the how to make your work policy relevant, right? So how long does it take for you to get into the IPC? IPCC, big models as an economic module. I think it would be really helpful because I have the impression that even today, um, Nordhaus kind of models are the standard when it comes to IPCC reports. Um, so when is this going to change? Um, other thing is if we accept that you know, current levels of uh, production are already unsustainable uh, when it comes to emissions, but also when it comes to the material footprint, for example. Um, I want to raise the question of you know, relative against absolute decoupling when it comes to those dimensions and how your models might address those. Uh, because in the last slide uh, from the last presentation, I still saw that the growth of uh, emissions is, I mean, it's lower in the baseline, but there still seems to be some growth of emissions, which I think is maybe not the, not the way forward. So, yeah, mm -hmm. thanks so much. Okay, I, I think that were enough questions. Nevertheless, I would like to add something because I was just um, happy to see my prejudices confirmed by the presentations of Maria and Andrea, a mm -hmm. little bit that you need a combination, and it's especially fiscal policy plus regulation or command and, um, how did you call it, command and something? Command, command and, and control. And control, thanks, <laughs> policies. Um, and you, you, th that was my feeling that you basically agree on that, that these, these combinations 
would be needed. Uh, you, dis you had slightly different results on the financial sector because for Maria it was more, mostly showing that green finance is not the main issue, the main tool, while in Andrea's presentation it was slightly different because you also discussed financial fragility issues. Um, yet, as Emanuele was rather focusing on what is missing in the models and what should be modeled in, in, the up, in, in new models, or what should we focus more on, um, I was wondering if you all three agree on that we mainly need this combination of fiscal and, and fiscal would then not just be the carbon tax, but fis, uh, carbon tax plus subsidies um, <coughs> and um, regulation, uh, or if you see major differences between your results in that regard. Thanks. Oh, yeah, maybe we then do again the reverse order, <laughs> so as, as you started. Emanuele? Oh, okay, reverse order on the yeah, previous so the reverse one. Of, of reverse, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, some of the questions um, were about policies, right? And I think the, the point um, that is usually made uh, uh, concerning your question, Gregor, is, uh, but I'm pretty sure you, you already know this, is probably not a carbon tax is bad. I mean, at least uh, we'll hear from, from Maria and Andrea. I didn't, I didn't get uh, that message, but rather than carbon tax, turbo tax is, is fine. It's just insufficient. And it might be bad if it's not compensated by other policies. So. You need carbon prices. Um, I don't know if they agree, but I would certainly agree with this statement. Uh, you do need uh, also maybe something else uh, to, speaking in, in economists' term, to capture um, other market failures, right? So carbon prices uh, tackle a specific market failure, but there doesn't, it doesn't capture others. But this is a well-known thing, right? So the innovation work uh, by, by Asimoglu and you know, the whole directed technical change literature, one of the main results is that if you have other market failures, then you need innovation subsidies. You need carbon taxes and innovation subsidies, right? And the, and the same, a similar point you can make about financial markets and credit markets. You can identify market failures that might not be solved by the carbon tax itself. This, this is how I interpret uh, uh, the, uh, both the theory and, and their models, but uh, they, they will be able to confirm if that's correct. Uh, how long does it take to become policy relevant? It's a, it's a fun question. I, I, I wish I knew. Um, I have to say that at the moment, uh, it, we, we seem to be experiencing uh, a sort of uh, paradigm shift in the attention, uh, at least from certain types of policymakers. I mentioned before this NGFS, this Network for Cleaning the Financial System, and they are I would say very receptive um, to new ideas. It might still be difficult to get in, of course, because then you have uh, you know, classical economists that are anyway still like the mainstream, uh, but they are receptive. Um, and uh, the IPCC uh, as well. Um, of course, the IPCC is a different beast, so you need to get in the IPCC cycle, which you know, takes a few years, and now, we're just in the in the conclusive months of the of the new assessment report, so one would have to wait uh, a few years to get to get uh, the research there. Uh, but um, they are not necessarily economists, and they're they're very open when it comes to use the, using the models. Though they might be not that open. Um, I I don't know of any non-traditional IAM within the IPCC report. The only one might be the E3ME um, uh, model by Cambridge Econometrics uh, that made it, you know, with with, with those, and you know, they they, they are essentially uh, developing a, a post canadian model of sorts. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop here. Thanks, Manuel. Um, let me first 
uh, explain the way through which we have this recycling of revenues. Uh, so um, what we do in the model is that we have a carbon taxes. So firms have uh, to pay uh, these taxes depending on the emissions. We have uh, different sectors. So if they have uh, the mining and utility sector has a lot of emissions, they have to pay more. But at the same time, uh, when uh, this specific uh, sector uh, has also a green investment, uh, they can uh, be given these subsidies or a kind of a funding. And as a result, the profitability is not affected. So this is why when I show uh, you these simulations with uh, the carbon tax, we have this decline in the growth rate of output, but when we have the recycling of revenues, we don't have it because uh, total profits are generally uh, kept at the same level, at the aggregate uh, level uh, in any case. So in this way, we don't uh, have this decline in uh, the growth rate of output, and as a result, unemployment rate uh, does not increase, uh, especially at the beginning of the simulations. Then. Um, Yes, uh, so um, I think the other question, and this is uh, what uh, Emanuele started discussing about uh, the role of carbon taxes and whether carbon taxes are necessary or uh, they are something bad. I would say that each of uh, the policy has its own benefits and its own drawbacks. Uh, I've shown you in the simulation that on its own carbon taxes are not effective, but of course if you combine them uh, with something else, uh, like uh, green subsidies, you can avoid uh, this uh, increase in the unemployment rate. So I'm not sure that we should stick with uh, carbon taxes, um, but if at least we combine them with something else, we could to some extent keep them, uh, probably because they are too easy to implement. Uh, to be implemented, so that was, would be one of the arguments. And another argument could be uh, that these carbon taxes could be implemented a bit differently. So there is a, a recent paper, I think, of De Luiso, uh, which showed that uh, if you have an announcement of carbon taxes, so firms are aware of this high increase in carbon tax, uh, they can uh, build up all that, they, they can change, uh, they can have green investment, less emissions, so the carbon tax will affect them more. So this is a bit linked with these expectations uh, part that I mentioned during the presentation. Uh, then uh, Elena, Elena um, mentioned about these uh, models um, that, and to some extent that we accept these uh, three degrees uh, Celsius. I would say uh, that I don't, expect, uh, uh, I don't accept uh, the three degrees uh, Celsius uh, scenario. And because I don't accept this type of scenarios, we want to find different policies that could be implemented in order to avoid that. Um, my feeling is that generally this is how you uh, can model dif different types of policies because you need to have the problem and as a result implement different policies and deal with this problem. But obviously there might be a different way in order to have this type of scenario. But probably it would be a different types of, anal of an analysis that you would like uh, to focus on. Um, yes, um, and there were some um, um, about the combination of uh, policies. Uh, I don't think that we have so different results, so many different results with uh, Andrea. I would say that overall uh, we show the effects of carbon tax, but of course they are implemented in a different way. Um, yeah, probably there is uh, this link with uh, the way that we implement carbon taxes. So uh, since we do that and we have uh, nothing else uh, than a, a gradually increase in carbon tax, we have this financial system with credit ration, but I'm aware that you also have a credit rationing. Uh, but yeah, I don't think that we have so different results. Uh, there. Andrea? Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, okay, well, let me just uh, jump from here and there. Well, the first, the temperature of three degrees, basically we don't accept it. The idea is to show that if you allow the system to go to three or to five degrees, I was not clear, uh, it's my fault, uh, uh, the economy basically collapse. That's the idea. So if you don't have shocks, if you, if you don't have climate shocks, everything is fine. But as soon as the climate can strikes back, basically the economy can collapse also at three uh, degree. And this also brings to absolute decoupling. Well, basically, uh, all the policy that we had, we had this idea of having this target of two degree. Uh, but uh, I agree with you that you also need uh, uh, absolute decoupling, especially if you want to go to 1.5. Well, this is something that you could track in the agent based model. And uh, you gave me a good idea to, also to, to work on this within the model. In principle, you can do and you can uh, precisely measure within the model wh which type of decoupling uh, 
uh, you have in terms of uh, uh, emission. I suspect that it can be something with the firms, not the energy sector, because if the energy sector becomes fully green, there are no problem. Oh, well, let me talk then uh, of uh, carbon tax, uh, carbon tax fee base and carbon tax, uh, uh, how economists see the carbon tax. Well, uh, Sebastian is right, we didn't uh, use fee base, and indeed it's something that we should do. Uh, I'm not fee base in the sense that you use carbon tax to pay for this subsidy. Uh, actually, uh, we are not saying that uh, carbon tax are bad. Of course, it's better to have carbon tax than nothing. But if you need to choose and you want to have a result which is better for climate change and better for the economic system, well, it's better to go for command and control policy plus subsidy and so on. Well, why I'm saying that and why economists are so obsessed of carbon tax, or the kind of fetishist of carbon tax? Well, because they are typically neoclassical economies. So neoclassical economy thinks that the market can always do the magic. So climate change as the pandemics can be treated as an as a issue of externality. And so you can always correct with a sort of carbon tax. I mean, I know an Italian economist that has developed the infection right. And he claimed that with infection right, you can solve the problem of the pandemics and so on, just to give you. Uh, an idea. Okay, so coming back to the to the more technical detail, uh, we already show in the even in the Achamoglu framework, the Achamoglu Agion uh, framework, where basically the argument of this fee based carbon tax plus subsidy, even in their model, if you pass the windows of opportunity, so you you delay the transition, carbon tax is not working while command and control is working better. We published something in the macroeconomic uh, uh, dynamics. Then, of course, this is a neoclassical framework. But then if you move to the framework of Maria, but also to my framework, there the situation is different because you recover all the Canadian inside, and also you can also have technical change, which already uh, is, is very relevant. So uh, this comes back not only to the neoclassical uh, convention, but the, the point, but also to a very old paper by Weizmann, which I don't know how many uh, uh, have uh, read, which is uh, even from a neoclassical framework is making the point where there is better to use quantity measure vis-a-vis uh, price uh, measure. I think that that paper is very insightful for, uh, for this uh, uh, discussion. Uh, the last thing, uh, well, I don't think that the result of uh, my result and the result of Maria are very uh, different, to be honest, because also on the financial side, we find that is not so the most important things. But uh, I was very happy to see the presentation of Maria, so we will discuss later to, to see uh, what are the things that we have in common and things that uh, are not in common. And uh, what is missing in this model? Well, uh, on the one hand, uh, the, the point that Emanuele was saying, which were basically network, uncertainty, expectation, are not completely missing in the sense that you already have all of that in uh, agent-based model without climate change. So it would not be very complicated to put them in an agent-based model with climate change. For instance, the, bro the, the homes uh, approach, we have a paper about that and so on. Uh, on the policy, what is missing is, I think, is a, a stronger emphasis on uh, uh, industrial policy and uh, in mission-oriented policy. So what basically we didn't test so far is a green mission-oriented government. So even having a public firm that do uh, green R&D or having a public research laboratory that def define new technology. Uh, without climate change, we find within this model that the entrepreneurial state works better than subsidy. So I expect that when, once we try this type of policy within this framework, this could go even uh, better. Okay, then thank you very much for the excellent presentation and the very interesting discussion. And thank you for being so patient. Uh, we now have dinner. Everyone is invited. Please eat, please eat a lot. We have too much food. Uh, <laughs> this will just be in the neighboring room, so you just have to go out and to the right, and then you find it. Hopefully that was correct. Any special rules? Not to my knowledge. So then... Thank you very much for being here. Please enjoy dinner and enjoy the evening. Thank you.